and you're back. Good for you. You pushed play. You are ready to watch the video all the way until the end. I hope that's at least the purpose here. I hope you are all getting used to the new format of our online lecture. This is week two, so by now I, I hope you are familiar with you know, the schedules, how you should do things. And um, we have in our last lecture relating to the Renaissance, we have touched upon the basic characteristics of Renaissance, uh, Renaissance humanism uh, as its intellectual underpinning or the drive uh, that, that drove intellectual history during the Renaissance. Uh, we observed some of the examples of the Renaissance thinker, of the Renaissance painters, sculpturers. Uh, we've seen how the both the Renaissance artists and the uh, humanist humanists, the, the thinkers, the writers, how they were working in a synergy or blending of the ancient traditions of Roman Greece and how they blended them with the elements of early Christianity. But today we are going to slightly shift our focus towards studying the political aspects of Renaissance, or we will observe the developments of politics and development of something we call the modern political thought, which is the invention of the Renaissance as well. Uh, and I was kind of a, a, a crucial feature of the Renaissance period. And to kind of uh, get us all started uh, with the discussion on politics, we will start by observing the politics of the so-called Italian city-states. So during the Renaissance, the territories of the, that are kind of like in different colors um, in the Italian peninsula. So the territory, especially in the northern Italy, was organized in these various different city states. Uh, uh, we are familiar with the city states term. We know what it means. So literally, uh, the Italian city states of 14th and 15th and 16th centuries were modeled after the ancient Greek city states into these, you know, self-governing, uh, self-sufficient, very independent kinds of community. So it's not like a, a unified nation state like we see in France or like we see in England at the time, right? But we see these various different smaller city states lacking cohesion. Um, and by the beginning of the 15th centuries, these city states, if you look at the border where they end and this uh, um, Holy Roman Empire stands right above it. So so that is to say that the Romans, that the Italian city states were no longer part of the Holy Roman Empire during the Renaissance. So we remember the Holy Roman Empire as being the territories in the Central Europe, including the Papal States and Italy. Well, since the Renaissance, this will no longer be the case for Italy. So Italy is going to be ruled by various different smaller uh, families. Um, that will be gaining power during the Renaissance in their respective city states. So these were, as I said, rather uh, independent centers of power. These city states were, they were independent uh, centers of, of culture and independent centers of Christian world altogether. And, and although, uh, as the color scheme on the map suggests, there were over a several dozen of a different city states, there were the ones, there, there were uh, the states that were stronger than the others. And we call them the big five or the, the strongest, the most powerful of the city states in Italy at the time. And in the south, uh, kind of represented in the green color, uh, in 
com encompassing the southern portion of Italian peninsula, but also Sicily and Sardinia, we have the Kingdom of Naples. And among all of the city-states in Italy at the time, the Kingdom of Naples was the only one that technically was still a monarchy. And it was ruled by a hereditary uh, a strain of leaders, so hereditary power and kings as we know them, right? Uh, on top of that, bordering the Naples, we in the purple, of course, have the Papal States. And the Papal States um, will kind of be the territories that in the past, as we know, were under the direct control of the Pope uh, sitting in Rome, right? But uh, since the 14th and especially in 15th centuries, they kind of, even the Papal States, kind of became largely independent and, and no longer as much under the uh, control or under the uh, strict uh, directive from the Pope himself. And so even in Rome, this, uh, this weakened papacy and weakened by, remember, uh, the stuff like a great schism, uh, the stuff like Babylonian captivity, the terms we learned about last week, uh, that will kind of uh, weaken uh, the, the, the supremacy of the popes in the Roman states and popes now kind of during the Renaissance actually had to compete with other noble families so the, of the aristocracy living in the papal states for the control of the government. So we no longer have a stable papacy anymore. In the other three remaining among the big five, we also have uh, Florence. Uh, it, Florence is yellow on your map, the center of culture, uh, cultural renaissance in Europe. Uh, then we also uh, have the Duchy of Milan uh, in kind of a, um, whatever this color is, whatever. And then we also have the Republic of Venice. Okay, so uh, the Naples, Papal States, Florence, Milan, and Venice were the big five, and and the the other three are kind of like bunched up in the northern uh, tip of the um, Italian map, if you will. And um, initially, talking about just Florence for a second, initially uh, Florence here in the yellow, Florence was established as a uh, a republic. But during the 15th century, it was ruled by, uh, if you remember from our last lecture, by Medici family. So they were this uh, a banking family in um, Florence who kind of fashioned Florence into this uh, great banking center into this great uh, manufacturing center, manufacturing of cloth in particular, the textiles, and also uh, just, you know, being a merchant-based society. And to contrast that, on the other side, we have the Republic of Venice, uh, and, and, and for uh, s some periods of time, the Venice kind of also expanded onto uh, the territories uh, and the islands in the Mediterranean Sea, um, and, and the Venice will establish uh, its city-state with being this maritime power. So it was kind of its force and its power was based on its navy and the ability to conduct this seaborne trade with uh, uh, other centers of trade in the east, but all and just altogether being the naval power of Europe during the Renaissance and at the time. Now, were there other uh, smaller states? Um, as we see on the map, yes, of course, were there were they as influential and as powerful as the other five were? Absolutely not. But nevertheless, they existed. Now, how did these big five get along? Will they get along well? That's going to be our next question. Well, the five city-states did not maintain a friendly relations among each other. They were kind of in this perpetual, uh, furious type of competition with one another. And we can say that while the Italian 
Um, Renaissance uh, was culturally blooming. Italian city-states were culturally blooming during the Renaissance. We can say that uh, politically, they were not blooming. The politically, they were fairly the political. Uh, politically, the city states were uh, largely uh, fractured because whenever um, one, for instance, Italian state kind of appeared to be gaining the predominant or the upper hand over the other city state in the peninsula, the other four states will kind of um, gather together and they would start to uh, challenge. They would combine to. Uh, go against to challenge uh, the the balance of power, if you will. And interestingly, uh, this competitive atmosphere among the big five will drive the political innovation and, and innovation in ways in which or innovation in how can we uh, uh, dom dominate over the other. So we see the emergence of the, for instance, machinery of the modern diplomacy. Uh, uh, so, for example, the world's first embassies will be established as the legacy of this competition of power of the Italian city-states during the Renaissance. So permanent embassies uh, with ambassadors from each uh, 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 from from other four of the city-states will be established. So for instance, just like today in America, we have embassies of France, England, Portugal, any country, you name it, there is an embassy of the world country in America today. Uh, so in the same way, the Italian city-states would for the first time send their representatives, send their ambassadors and diplomats uh, to kind of uh, try to uh, continue to pursue the political relations and, and the uh, uh, environment of negotiation when it was necessary and it really was necessary. So the permanent embassies will be the invention of the uh, 15th century Italian city-states uh, and the resident ambassador uh, was one of the great political achievements of Italian Renaissance. Aside from being in this continuously competitive um, relations with one another, the Italian city-states will also be caught in a bad storm of foreign invasions that will also trouble its territories. So starting from uh, a 19, I'm sorry, uh, 1494, Italians will experience uh, foreign invasions which honestly they called upon themselves. And it happened when at the end of the 15th century, uh, the city-states of Florence and Naples will forge alliance together with a goal of conquering the city-state of Milan. So Florence and Naples conspire to challenge the balance of power of Milan. And at that point, uh, the city-state of Milan kind of got frightened and they decided to call in for help. And they called no other than the victor of the Hundred Years' War, and that is the country of France. So Milan will call on France to help them, uh, and the French king, Charles VIII, uh, he will invade Italy, pursuing to help the city-state of Milan in 1494. So Charles VIII, by the way, is the successor of Charles VII or, or, or Charles the Victor, who was crowned the French king because France was victorious after uh, the ha France was victorious power of the Hundred Years' War. So the clash between France and England. So 50 years after um, a France finishes war with, Fran uh, with England, France will enter another war um, occurring in Italy. And, and the French invasion in the late 15th century will set in place a period or a new period in Italian 
and European power politics because um, you will kind of, it will kind of, it, it, Italy in general will kind of become a battleground of various different powers of Europe attacking it. And multiple uh, uh, foreign um, militaries will kind of challenge each other on the territory of uh, Italy in general. And almost it was a place uh, uh, where various different powers, particularly France, going against Spain, uh, they will kind of uh, uh, play or, or, or wage the proxy wars. So aside from uh, France, um, King Ferdinand II of Spain, uh, he will um, kind of forge alliance with the Holy Roman Emperor to intervene as well. So it was kind of Spain plus Holy Roman Empire against France on the territory of Italian peninsula. And needless to say, uh, this will put Italian city-states into a very uh, vulnerable uh, situation of continual warfare. Uh, and because the Italian cities will kind of, uh, they will fail to generate or they will fa fail to come up with this a uniform response. Oh, okay, how are we supposed to respond to these foreign invasions? Because we are failing to consolidate Consolidate as all of the different city states, um, or kind of like establish a common foreign policy, because Italian city states failed to do so. This will lead Italians to uh, kind of enter into a 400 years period in which Italy will be this continuous battleground, and in which Italian city states will. Uh, be challenging or trying to dominate the territory of Italy. And, and Italy, because of those reasons, Italy will fail to achieve unification until uh, like late 19th century. I think it was about 70, I'm sorry, uh, 1870 or 1871 when Italy will finally uh, unite. So uh, Anyways, it was a very uh, disturbing kind of environment for Italy politically, starting in the late 15th century and continuing all the way through the late 19th century. So it was in this atmosphere of foreign invasions and atmosphere of, of highly politicized uh, competition between the Italian city-states firstly and then Italian city-states versus the foreign powers uh, that we see a new branch, a new kind of humanism uh, being born. And it will be called civic humanism, all right? And civic humanism, it kind of rests on uh, the premise that, you know, humans need to deploy their skills, uh, their great human potential, and which we all have, right, as, um, uh, as argued by humanists in general, uh, and kind of apply those skills to the world of politics. So we can define it if we have to, civic humanism as this application of the humanist values uh, to the world of politics. And, uh, or how to make, how should I as a humanist, how can I make myself useful to the state itself. And, and civic humanists, they will argue that, that people need to uh, get engaged in the government. So just like ancient uh, Greeks, for instance, will uh, participate in the direct democracy, so physically walk into the agora and physically voting in favor or against a certain uh, policy, Italians will say, well, we need to deploy um, our skills, our our minds, our brains, to make our state better, to kind of fix it from all the problems it's facing. And so Italians will want to use their governmental skills uh, out of this sense of, of patriotism. So to participate in government, civic humanists will argue, is, is to use your knowledge to make your country better. And that is a very patriotic thing to do, right? So civic humanists will insist that, for instance, people in general need to start to think about how can I use my personal 
personal toolkit, the set of skills I already possess, uh, and how can I be useful to the states, and, and how can I use this to actively be relevant in the world? Because remember, according to humanists, the purpose of life is to make yourself useful through studying seven different sciences, to be as, as much well-versed in different fields as you can, and then using that knowledge to actually perfect the world, to make it perfect, and to make it a better place to live. So that's the same stuff here, but applied to the world of government and the world of politics. So civic humanists will be... Uh, um, making all sorts of uh, patriotic writings uh, and, and they will look again uh, as any humanist would do to the ancient world as their major source of the, inf of, of the inspiration. And the perhaps most famous and well-renowned of the civic humanists was, of course, a, a, a guy from Florence named Niccolo Machiavelli. And, and he was the ultimately or, or the ultimate political theorist of the Renaissance period. Uh, Machiavelli, he has he had his own toolkit or set of skills he had to offer. He was was a uh, diplomat. He was a politician. He later became a, a statesman. But most of all, he was a civic humanist, uh, and, and he lived in uh, Florence during the Renaissance. So during this period of turmoil uh, that Florence was experiencing foreign invasions um, and that I just told you about. So uh, a time in which city-states uh, in Italy were kind of aligning against various Italian, I mean, various European powers. And in Florence in particular, as we said, uh, the Medici family was the main family in charge. Uh, but as we said, Florentine regime or Italy in general was invaded by Charles VIII. So they were invaded by the French in 1494. And Medici family during that time was forced to exile. So they were forced to be physically removed from their seat of power and go elsewhere to kind of just escape. Uh, while France was controlled by the... Um, I'm sorry, while Florence was in control by the French, uh, and while Medici family spent their time in the exile, well, Machiavelli, he will work as a, a, a diplomat uh, of the French government. So he was uh, responsible for diplomatic missions uh, and organizing civic army for uh, the French or citizen army for the French. So he was like employed by the French government residing in Florence. And almost uh, after about two decades, after about 20 years, uh, by the end of 1513, French will finally be pushed out of Florence. And of course, they, the Medici family, the ones ruling, the ones dominating uh, uh, bankers and financiers and uh, kind of almost owners of the uh, of Florence, they will come back and, and they will come back to dominate political life in Florence altogether. And when they return, uh, they will, of course, put in prison everybody who worked for the French government. And that, of course, included Niccolo Machiavelli. So uh, Machiavelli was arrested, he was tortured, and he was imprisoned. That was a standard uh, procedure by Medici for anybody who was uh, working with a uh, French government. Uh, and, and while Machiavelli was in prison, he will dedicate his time to write his masterpiece called Il Principe, or uh, translated as the prince. Uh, and, and the prince will become perhaps the most famous book on politics uh, ever written. And he essentially wrote prince for the Medici family. And the reason why he wrote it 
is because uh, he, as, as a true civic humanist would, he wanted to show Medici family what he has to offer and, and to kind of prove that he is smart enough and that he is a, a fit to uh, serve in the government so that he is fit for the public service. And, and he uh, will, uh, because of that, he say, well, you Medici have to uh, hire me as your own personal political advisor. So literally we can say that uh, Prince, the prince, was uh, like Medici's job application. Uh, and, and the purpose of the prince was to demonstrate to Medici family that he wants to actively participate in their government. He wants them to employ him and he wants to be relevant in the world like any civic humanist would want to be. Um, and overall, the prince, uh, the content of the prince will be that it is an advice book. So we are familiar that humanists are writing various different advice books on life and on anything, uh, or it was a rule book for what kinds of characteristics uh, will make a good prince or will make a good ruler or, or altogether a good state's person, any kind of public servant. Um, and he will write this book based on the knowledge that he himself has kind of gathered uh, from his own experience as a politician, as a diplomat, um, and, and the advice uh, that Machiavelli thought at the time was actually necessary in, in this time of highly politicized uh, competition in Florence altogether. So he's like, oh, look, all of the stuff I know, if you hire me, I can help you fix this problem. I can help you be powerful again. And here are the rules that you need to follow if you want to be successful, Medici family, and if you want your power never to be challenged again. So that's basically the, the, the major reason behind the prince. And the prince formally is, is considered kind of uh, to be the first guide to modern politics or, or the first modern business of ruling. And, and the reason why the prince uh, as a work of uh, political theory is popular is precisely because of the uh, uh, tenacity or because of the uh, audaciousness of the Machiavelli's arguments. So that is to say it's famous because it's very controversial. Uh, and, and the arguments Machiavelli is proposing on what or who is the good prince are very controversial. They were at the time and they kind of still are today. And it's controversial, particularly because uh, Machiavelli, he will divorce or split the world of politics uh, or the job of politicking uh, from the realm or from the uh, uh, kind of uh, territory of religion and ethics. So the prince kind of introduces to the Renaissance uh, uh, audiences, these pr this principle of, of modern political thought uh, that was controversial because he will say that the way medieval political philosophers understood politics is wrong. We cannot assume that Christianity and good government go hand in hand. So he will say these medieval political philosophers argued that the gold standard or, or the basic standard by which all politicians, all governments should be judged uh, is whether they are following the principles established by the God. So medieval scholars, medieval political theorists that came before Machiavelli, they will say, if you are a good Christian, then that means you automatically are a good ruler. If you follow morals of Christianity, you yourself must be a good ruler. So good for you. As simple as that, right? But Machiavelli will say, you know, that's actually wrong. Um, and Machiavelli will disagree with this assumption. And instead, he will argue that, you know, governments 
should not be judged based on how good of a Christian government they are or how good of a Christian particular prince or ruler is, but rather by how well you are providing for security, you are providing for order, safety, and stability of your constituents or the people you are ruling over. So that is to say that the ruler must do whatever it takes, any means necessary, uh, to protect people, even if that means breaking the laws of Christianity, even if that means to lie, steal, cheat, uh, a murder, um, uh, and, and you know that is you know it, it you know touche if you have to do those things. You you sometimes have to employ these measures in order to provide stability uh, and security of your people. So he's divorcing the realm of the politics from moral standards of Christianity, and he says the good rule is not necessarily a good Christian, right? So that's what this means. And there are uh, uh, several debates that Machiavelli engages in when he is discussing these desirable qualities of the prince. So let's take a look at just a few of the most important uh, uh, ones or the most important debates. And the first one is a debate between ethics and versus immorality, okay? Uh, ethics versus morality, or that is to say, uh, uh, or a question of whether a good ruler should be moral or a, a nice and uh, Christian good ruler, or if he should be immoral at times, right? And Machiavelli says uh, he, the ruler needs to be both. He is saying that being nice is a good virtue in general, but what citizen citizens need is for a ruler to be effective. And so here's what he will say. Many have imagined republics and principalities that have never been seen or known to exist in truth. For a man who wants to make a profession of good in all regards must come to ruin among so many who are not good. And hence, it is necessary to a prince, if he wants to maintain himself, to learn to be able not to be good and to use this or not to use it according to the necessity. So at its core, Machiavelli is suggesting here, the good prince is actually both moral and immoral. Uh, so it's almost impossible, he's saying, it's almost impossible to be a good politician and to be a good Christian at the same time. And, and the main responsibility that the prince has is to, of course, defend the state from the foreign threats, from the domestic threats. Uh, and, and people should neither think of a ruler as this person who is too meek or, or who is too easy and too soft, because those kind of people are easy to take advantage of, right? Nor should the ruler be very cruel, very brutal, uh, because if the ruler is very very cruel and very brutal, very immoral, then people will rebel against him. So he instead, Machiavelli says, needs to be both at the same time and just kind of apply uh, the morality or immorality as necessary, right? So he, the ruler, uh, should be very like unapproachably strict, uh, uh, but still reasonable. Uh, and, and now, Hearing all of this, you it's very important, okay? It's very, don't take him the wrong way. Uh, uh, he, uh, and I'm not trying to defend him, but these are his own arguments, right? He, uh, Machiavelli, is not someone who is necessarily saying that the ruler needs to be evil. Um, Machiavelli says, uh, I'm not advocating for immorality. Uh, he is not actively encouraging people or encouraging statesmen to do wrong or to hurt 
others without any reason. Uh, but the government, he says, can always do ethically and morally right thing. Uh, but you have to choose, you have to be prepared to do bad things if they become necessary, right? So very important. Standards of morality do exist, but the good prince kind of acts according to the issue at hand or according to the cards he's been dealt with, okay? Uh, and, and, and then there is uh, another famous debate that Machiavelli engages in. It is disguised as a metaphor uh, about whether a prince uh, can either be a fox or a lion, uh, with qualities of a fox being uh, someone who is uh, very witty, uh, a very uh, a cunning, uh, crafty, but also has the ability to lie and deceive. Uh, and, and a lion as this uh, figure that is ruthless, that is uh, ferocious, uh, fierce, and kind of very forceful and violent at the times. And, and here, is, uh, here is what uh, Machiavelli has to say about whether a ruler should be a fox or a lion. He says, since a prince is compelled of necessity to know well how to use the beast, he should pick fox and the lion, because the lion does not defend itself from snares, and the fox does not often itself from wolves. So one needs to be a fox to recognize snares and a lion to frighten the wolves. A prudent lord, therefore, cannot observe fate, nor should he, when such observance turns against him, and the causes that made him promise have been eliminated. So even though uh, a previous politicians, previous uh, uh, theoreticians of uh, politics would suggest that a good ruler is the one who is neither fox nor lion, uh, because both fox and lion are led by deception. Machiavelli says, actually, you should be both. You should employ qualities of both the fox and the lion. If circumstances are such that you must be fierce and that you need to lie, uh, then, you know, that's just the cards, again, that you've been dealt with, and you should act accordingly. And overall, uh, the best princess uh, are... <laughs> masters of deceptions. So they made arguments to their advantage and are kind of ready to break these uh, um, uh, uh, they, agreements, not arguments, uh, they're kind of ready to make agreements to their advantage and then they are breaking their agreements when the need arises. And also if you are um, uh, you, you, the qualities that the ruler might have uh, that are expected for a ruler to have. So stuff like being generous, helping to the poor, or like extending the hand, the hand, or turning the other cheek. Now Machiavelli will say you, um, you don't have to necessarily have those, but you have to to the people at least uh, show as if you appear that you have these qualities. So even though you personally don't believe you should be doing good things, at least you have to show people that there is an appearance of you as a good person, even though you yourself are not a good person, okay? So that's, that's very, uh, uh, that was very troublesome for people to digest. And in many ways, it's still troublesome for us to digest those arguments as well. Now, um, this debate also leads us to the last and perhaps uh, the most important of the questions of Machiavelli's political theory, and that is whether it's better for a ruler to be loved or is it better for a ruler to be feared? Uh, and here's what he says. No surprise here. The response is that one would want to be both the one and the other. But because it is difficult to put them together, you can't be both at the same time, it is much safer to be feared than to be loved. If one has to choose, if one 
has to choose one of the two, right? So the response here overwhelmingly, uh, if you have to be both moral and immoral, be both. If you have to be a fox and a lion, be both. But if you have to choose between loved versus feared, choose feared. Because it's different to put them together. Uh, it's much safer to be feared uh, if one has to choose between the two. So perhaps uh, here lies the argument that is the most controversial. It is best to be both, but it's much safer to be prince uh, as a cruel ruler and to be feared for your cruelty than for you to be loved. Because if you are loved, then people will take advantage of you. They will take advantage of your goodness. So politicians need to be cruel if necessary to protect the state is actually the argument here. And he will provide, he will say, yes, you have to be cruel, but here is some criteria for what constitutes as a good occasion to be uh, violent, okay? So if you really must apply violence and you're advised to do so, here are the criteria. So first, you have to make sure that uh, violence must be strictly necessary for the security of the state. Also, if you are to apply violence, you must do so swiftly. You have to do it fast and you should not repeat it too often either. And cruelty, lastly, must be applied only if it's used in self-defense or if it's used for a greater good of the subjects and not used very frequently because that will turn you into a very infamous and hated ruler, okay? Uh, so there's difference between being a hated rebel against ruler who is all the time violent and, and a ruler who applies violence and, as necessary in order to uh, provide security of the state and in order to provide for the self-defense, okay? And in fact, uh, Machiavelli will add that a ruler can be brutal, yes, but, quote, he ought to avoid making himself hated, okay? So you have to be feared, but you have to be careful uh, that you don't become hated. So he's suggesting here is that there is a fine line between having appearance of a fearful ruler or an hated ruler, and a good prince must be very uh, tactful. He must be tactful enough uh, to know precisely where the line between hated and feared ruler is. So there it is, uh, you know, Machiavelli establishing himself as the author of the um, uh, first modern guide to politics. And, and he, it was probably not a surprise uh, to say that he was denounced for writing it, and, and because people in general uh, disagreed with his arguments, people kind of came to use the word Machiavellian to apply to a ruler or a statesperson or a politician who is particularly ruthless uh, and, and very uh, violent and brutal and sometimes totalitarian. So if you were to say that any uh, president or any uh, a politician today rules in a Machiavellian fashion, that is to say that he's fox and a lion, that he is cunning and witty and deceitful, and that he uh, does not really apply the rules of Christianity for his ruling standards or any kind of, of religious uh, based uh, uh, morality to guide his rule uh, or to guide his hand in ruling. So someone who is ruthless, basically. Um, a Machiavellian leader uh, is the one who, of course, me um, lives the principle that the means justify the ends and he does not kind of shy away from using brutality. Okay, so that's a definition of Machiavellian ruler. So Machiavelli, will put on a new version of what it means to be perfect in uh, this renaissance quest for perfection, right? A perfect government, 
is a government that's pragmatic. Uh, it's it's a, a government that's um, uh, realistic, a, a government that is secular, so not guided by the rules of Christianity or any religion. And it's very much no nonsense uh, kind of government, right? A government that does not that does what needs to be done, uh, even getting away with murder uh, to achieve order and stability. Okay, so that's that's Machiavelli for you uh, here in a nutshell. Okay, so um, so far we have studied uh, a Renaissance as a period of uh, a rebirth. Uh, in art, of rebirth in politics, so abandoning medieval standards of politics and re reintroducing something new, uh, and also a rebirth of intellectual history altogether. But we observe these things as movements occurring in one place in particular, in Italy, right? Um, and Italian Renaissance writers, artists, creators, Machiavelli, uh, were definitely the most renowned, the most famous, if you will, and, and the most prolific, the, the ones producing the most material. Uh, but Renaissance was, of course, not um, kind of only Italian thing. It was not just Italian event uh, because it also occurred on the other side of the Alps um, and north of Italian border as well, which is how we get to the uh, topic of Northern Renaissance. And kind of the end of the Hundred Years' War between uh, France and England in 1453 will kind of allow uh, a Renaissance ideas to penetrate uh, to other countries north of Italy and, and kind of uh, the um, the, the 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 resources, the money that a French and English used to use to fight against each other were now relocated uh, and, and also uh, were kind of uh, put into financing of the arts, into financing of the sciences and the production of literature instead. So we are no longer using money to pay for the war, but we are rather using it for the culture, for the literature, for people to read and write. Uh, so after Renaissance was set in motion in Italy in the 14th century, it will kind of spill over uh, in the mid 15th century uh, to the other centers in Europe. Well, how did this happen? Well, uh, in the late 15th century, uh, uh, students from other territories in Europe, including France, including Germany, uh, or Holy Roman Empire, and including England, they will start attending universities in Italy, and they will kind of expo be exposed to the ideas of humanism. So they will, uh, after their studies were done, uh, these students from other European countries would go back and they uh, to their own countries, and they will start spreading these humanist ideas. And, and just like uh, their counterparts uh, in Italy, uh, a Northern Renaissance writers will also start arguing for uh, stuff like, you know, this uh, admired eloquence of the uh, classical ancient literature. Uh, and, and, you know, they would admire the style in which it was written. Uh, and, and, and they will kind of start to interpret these Italian ideas and attitudes about certain ancient texts uh, and kind of uh, come up with uh, their own interpretations of what it's a, what what does it mean to have a perfect society? What does it mean to be perfect? What is the perfect ideal altogether? And one of the examples, perhaps most renowned examples of no Northern Renaissance, was definitely Thomas More, and he was a humanist from England, uh, and he will begin his professional career as a lawyer, but he then will go to study classics, and he will then enter uh, the government service. And as any uh, a Renaissance writer uh, would do at the time, he uh, will find himself a role model uh, of the past, so like an ancient role model to follow. 
and he found his role model in the ancient Greek philosopher Plato. And Plato, if you remember, Plato thought that the best way to kind of learn something was to uh, think of it as perfect or to think of it in its perfect and its ideal form. So if you, for instance, um, wanted to learn uh, more about justice, uh, about fairness in a society, uh, then you would have to really think hard and imagine what this ideal justice in your head, what this ideal justice would look like, uh, rather than looking around you uh, at actual examples of justice in real life. Because according to Plato, there is no such thing as perfect justice in real life. So you, you have to imagine this perfect society in your own head. Okay. And now following Plato's ideas of these ideal forms of these ideal societies, um, uh, Moore will start to, of course, speculate what does it constitute a what what constitutes a perfect society, and he will call this perfect very imagined society a utopia, okay? So utopia is basically a word that Moore will invent from the Greek word for nowhere, okay? So utopia will then also become a title of his perhaps most famous work. And, and Utopia is written as a, a dialogue between a Moore and uh, uh, this person who uh, is kind of um, talking to Moore about this place that he just recently returned from, this, this newly discovered land called Utopia, and he is telling Moore how great this place is. And, and Utopia essentially describes a an island community somewhere in the middle of uh, in, in somewhere near Europe uh, that largely resembles paradise so a place where um, for instance all children have great education all adults divide their days perfectly between you know work and intellectual activities uh, all the problems that troubled france and uh, uh, england and other european countries such as war and poverty and hunger and economic inequality like those things no longer exist uh, uh, it's a place where private property is abandoned uh, there is also a uh, religious toleration so it's basically a, a, a society without any problems whatsoever, right? Um, and, and here's what he said. I don't have an excerpt for you on the slide because I forgot to put it on, but just listen to me read, I guess. He says, in Utopia, he says, quote, to my mind, the Utopian Republic is not only the best country in the world, but the only one that has the right to call itself a republic. Elsewhere, people are always talking about the public interests, but all they really care about is private property. In Utopia, where there is no private property, people take their duty to public seriously, and both attitudes are perfectly reasonable. In other republics, practically everyone knows that if he doesn't look out for himself, he will starve to death, however prosperous his country might be. But in Utopia, where everything is under public ownership, no one has any fear of going short. Everyone gets a fair share, so there are never any poor men, there are never beggars. Nobody owns anything, but everybody is rich. For what greater wealth can there be, can there be than cheerfulness, peace of mind, and freedom from anxiety? Instead of being worried about his food supply, upset by plaintive demands of his wife, the utopian can feel absolutely sure that he, his wife, his children, his grandchildren, and his long line of descendants will always have enough to eat and enough to make them happy, end quote. So ideal uh, a society, according to Thomas More, is this almost a uh, prototype um, 
communist society, if you ask me, because we are abandoning the idea of private property, of private ownership, and instead replacing the private property with the idea of communal property. And you can argue that um, the theoreticians of Marxism, of, of, of communism, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, they will largely look at Thomas More to find their inspiration for their communist manifesto. Please take 102 to learn more, History 102, uh, to have the opportunity to learn more about the ideologies, the modern ideologies. But nevertheless, uh, back to uh, Thomas More, he, um, the purpose of him writing Utopia is kind of debatable amongst scholars. Uh, some scholars, historians say that, you know, well, he just wrote this because he is just being critical of his own violent, very hierarchy based society, very materialist, right? We are just hoping that we can just make more money and that's going to make everything better, right? He was like angry at people who are driven by material possessions. Um, and others will argue and say, well, basically that's not what he was arguing because look at him. He's like the epitome of a wealthy person, right? He will, they will say that the Moore wrote this almost as a satire, as a describing a place that we all know will never exist. And he's just like, trying to make an argument to pass his time, right? Uh, which one is it? Why did he wrote it? Well, he never actually tell us, tells us. Um, it's kind of open up for a debate, if you will. And if you wish, you can write to me uh, with your interpretation um, of what do you think of this kind of utopian society. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, uh, Moore's ideas, as you probably can imagine were fairly impactful. And, and ever since Utopia was published in 1516, the word utopia or the word utopian as we know it today will continue to be uh, referred as this uh, imagined place, a paradise of sorts in which everything is ideal everything is in order and people are just happy, right? So more will actually inspire a literary movement uh, of this utopian uh, fiction stories uh, and utopias uh, kind of are very common in fiction novels, especially science uh, fiction. Uh, I know for a fact that uh, at Star Trek, if you're fans of Star Trek, you probably know uh, that it has utopian uh, elements uh, with the United Federation of Planets kind of being this perfectly egalitarian society with all sorts of representatives where everything is perfect and stable, uh, uh, right? Uh, but, you know, aside from... Uh, uh, utopia more also uh, argues that there is a flip side of utopia and it's called dystopia and and dystopia is this equally imagined society where there where nothing is perfect and everything is wrong. And, and in society that has great suffering, a great injustice, and it's almost this uh, a post-apocalyptic kind of place. Uh, and, and this also will inspire series of imagined stories or, or fiction stories about the dystopian societies. So uh, alive after apocalypse or during the apocalypse. So if you watched Hunger Games movie, or if you read Hunger Games as a novel, uh, you probably are familiar with uh, uh, what a dystopian society. That's like an example of dystopian society. But but more uh, uh, maybe well not maybe more famous. But uh, the the example that's been longer with us is a novel written by uh, George Orwell, and it's called uh, uh, Nineteen of Eighty Four. 
And it's a novel about, or it kind of describes a place uh, called Oceania that was governed by this uh, a party that had brainwashed people, uh, and then kind of it was like an all-controlling, very uh, absolutist, very totalitarian kind of government uh, that kind of forced and brainwashed people into following the leader called the Big Brother, who just kind of is constantly circling around surveilling everything and everybody and it's a society in which everything is recorded because people are so bad that they need to constantly be monitored right uh, and, and that will inspire uh, these ideas will inspire uh, reality shows such as uh, The Big Brother. I don't, I don't know if you are old enough to remember The Big Brother. I don't know if it's still a thing. It might be. I don't know. But definitely, when I was growing up, Big Brother, the reality show, was a big thing. So this dystopian society in which everybody needs to be surveilled continuously. Examples are many. I can go on. But we have to continue with our we have to wrap up our story here in this lecture so now um back to northern renaissance um if european students studying um, um at universities or attending universities in italy was one of the reasons uh, why the Renaissance will spread in the Northern Europe, and, and the second reason being the end of the Hundred Years' War, a kind of providing the money necessary to finance the arts and culture. Then a third reason why a Renaissance spreads rapidly in the uh, Northern uh, or north of Italy and in Northern Europe will be the invention of the printing press. Because before the application of the printing press in the 14th century, when, when, you know, when Renaissance was still fairly nascent, when it was still fairly new in Italy, uh, the words of the people we talked about this week, so people like uh, Leon Battista Alberti, Petrarca, even Machiavelli, uh, they were kind of, you know, written down, but were spread out slowly. So there was really no line of communication of printing multiple books and sharing these ideas with multiple people. But that will change in the 15th century, because since 15th century, the, the ideas of uh, people like Thomas More or any other rest of the humanists, um, uh, they will start spreading quickly through the printing press, which, of course, allowed thousands and thousands of identical copies to be made in a very short time. And the oldest printing press was actually invented in China sometime in the first century AD. So by no means were the Europeans the inventor of printing. Don't get me wrong, right? But a person named Johann Gutenberg, he will perfect the earlier forms of Chinese printing devices, and he will kind of uh, make it perfect and made it so that, you know, the textbooks or any texts can be massively produced. And, and he will do so in the German city of Mainz in 1448, so in the mid-15th century. And, and he um, and we should not give him all credit. He uh, will work with several different um, metal smiths uh, working in Germany alongside with him, but they will use the technology that was previously uh, used in metal stamps. So pressing, literally pressing the metal ink on the metal board, uh, kind of containing letters and symbols, and then pressing that board against uh, the uh, uh, kind of paper surface. Uh, and, and Gutenberg's printing press could make uh, like infinite changes to words, infinite changes to letters and fonts. So if you see, uh, where is it? There you are. So if you see this uh, a piece of metal, so you would take it, you would literally arrange words and letters onto this metal board, and you would dip uh, this, this round looking uh, um, 
I should have put a picture on it, but there's this uh, a round looking uh, almost sponge. You would dip it in the ink and then you would press the sponge against the letters on a metal surface. And right here is where the white piece of paper was placed. And then this was kind of like lowered down to be pressed on the actual piece of paper. So like smearing the letter characters onto the uh, 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 paper, uh, kind of a paper surface. Um, and, you know, they would be printing uh, things on paper, which we know was also a product or the originating uh, in ancient China. Uh, and this uh, technology of printer, uh, of uh, paper printing, was brought to Europe via uh, Muslims in Spain in 8th century. You already know this. We've talked about this before. So paper, uh, you know, paper was cheaper than things that they would use to print things on, such as the vellum. And vellum was this uh, uh, animal skins that were really expensive to produce and were kind of really hard to press on, right? And so uh, uh, they will, with the paper and with the printing press, produce uh, more books faster and cheaper. And all of this will lead to uh, this uh, democratization of knowledge. So more people had access ever done before to books and to the prints. So more people, lay people, uh, commoners now had the access to books and to the printed words of not just Renaissance, but everything altogether. So it was no longer, uh, when I say democratization, that means that more people uh, were reading and learning to read and write because of the invention of the printing press. So not only is just the clergy and nobility uh, people of uh, not only are the clergy and nobility people of the knowledge, but also the commoners are learning to read and write. And by the end of the 15th century, uh, the urban literacy will increase because schools will start, the public schools will start to be established uh, uh, across Europe, the primary schools. Um, for our people to learn uh, in Europe. And, and so one of the legacies of the Renaissance will definitely be this spread of knowledge to a broader population of people. And, and more people than ever before will learn to read and write uh, now that the books are produced in larger quantities. And, and by 1500s, uh, 60 German cities had their own own printing presses and 200 more existed throughout the Europe. So definitely an increase in book production, which is good. It's a win-win for everybody. Now, when Gutenberg uh, first invented the printing press, uh, he, the first book, it's probably no surprise, the first book he will decide to make multiple copies of will be the Bible or the so-called the Gutenberg Bible. And he will uh, produce the initial, the original production of Gutenberg Bible had only 180 copies, okay? But nevertheless, with the application of the same method and with the increase of numbers of printing presses across the Europe, uh, by only uh, uh, a half century, century later, there was somewhere between 8 million and 20 million Bibles uh, or, or printed copies of the Bibles present all across Europe. And, and that number is far greater uh, than any number of books uh, produced all over the Western history up until that point altogether, right? So the, the side effect of having more books, right, is people reading them. And, and, and what, uh, what happens when people, regular people, start reading the Bible? How does that make the church and the clergy look? Well, literate people, people who would learn to read and write, they would come to uh, question popes. They will come to question kings because up until that point, the popes and the kings were the ones interpreting the Bible to the vast society who was unable to read because they had no access to books, right? Uh, so they would start to question any authorities to whom they relied on in the past 
to interpret the Bible for them. So the laity, the common people uh, like me and you, became to question the clergy. So we can say that the unintended consequence of the Renaissance, and especially the innovation of the printing press, will usher this uh, a new period of people beginning to question and people challenging uh, the tradition in religion and, and challenging the authority of the Pope and challenging the authority of the Catholic Church itself. And this will lead to the Protestant Reformation, right? The, the big topic, uh, the, the next big topic of our discussion, to which we will come to, of course, next week. Okay, so uh, that's all I have for you today. I hope you will have the good rest of the day, and I hope to see you again soon next week or see you not see you i hope that you will listen to the lectures next week okay have a great weekend